Okay, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I'm going to talk about um, UV spectra with TSHST of compact galactic planetary nebula for insight on post on gas phase carbon uh, in AGB ejecta. Thank you for to my collaborators, in particular to Dick and Anibal that have reviewed this talk. And um, this is a might be a little different from other talks in this meeting. This start with uh, cosmology and galactic evolution. <laughs> But you'll see that planetary nebula are essential. So this is another application of, plan of planetary nebula. In the plot, you see from a paper by Curti et al. 2020, um, the evolution of galactic metallistic gradients uh, as a function of redshift, where uh, we have plotted with uh, straight lines the models. I don't know if you can see my arrow, but it doesn't matter. The upper uh, group of models are with enhanced feedback and the lower models are without uh, enhanced feedback. Um, all the data at redshift uh, uh, from zero all the way to high redshift uh, are based on uh, radial metallistic gradient based on oxygen from galaxies at, at the given redshift from H2 regions. And of course, um, strong line abundances because you cannot do um, direct abundances at high redshift. Uh, the only direct abundances that you can uh, put in that plot are abundances of galactic planetary nebula. How can you put ga a galactic planetary nebula at high redshift? You can, because uh, the oxygen of a planetary nebula at zero approximation is the oxygen of the progenitor when the progenitor was formed. Because the oxygen doesn't evolve in planetary nebula, as you all know, or very little. So um, a planetary nebula that has a progenitor mass of one solar mass, for example, uh, has formed uh, maybe eight giga years ago. Um, so uh, the oxygen and the gradient uh, from oxygen from these probes in the galaxy probe that particular epoch in uh, galactic evolution. So we can do cosmology with planetary nebula. And we've done it. Uh, those uh, dots that you see there, the yellow dots, are from Stangelini and Highwood 2018, where we divide the planetary nebula in age population. The problem is that uh, th these age populations are based only on nitrogen and helium abundances, which are the easy ones. But really, without carbon in planetary nebula, you cannot resolve the degeneracy of the models. So it's much better to have carbon. And then uh, we started uh, we started to look for carbon in galactic planetary nebula. This is the, not the only motivation, of course. There are other motivation. Uh, in this plot, you see uh, the carbon and oxygen gas abundances versus uh, the dust abundances of planetary nebula after the Spitzer uh, LMC and SMC data. And you see that there is direct correspondence between gas and dust. It's obvious, but it was never proven before. And it's not uh, obvious in the galaxy. We only have a few uh, uh, planetary nebula with gas and dust measurement. And so we have to extend that because Spitzer only got the, got the dust composition for a point source planetary nebula. So there are the galactic planetary nebula, but they don't have carbon. Third motivation to get carbon in planetary nebula is to match uh, stellar and uh, nebula evolution and see if single uh, star or binary non-C uh, evolution can explain planetary nebula and what is the role of morphology and eventually also of substellar companions. Um, I went in, before writing the HST proposal, I went in the literature and presently only seven, seven galactic planetary nebula have carbon abundance from US, UV HST. And uh, as you all know, uh, the major uh, lines for carbon are in the UV. And about 30 have IUE derived abundances, which are great, but they are generally for large nearby bright extended planetary nebula, which means there is no Spitzer data and which means um, they are nearby, so they are really useless for gradients. So there we go. Uh, we built this uh, slitless spectroscopy, almost slitless spectroscopy of HST uh, UV. Um, the exposure time is less than uh, one hour, so we were really constrained in which targets to select, but we end up with uh, having 75 targets approved. 
but only 30 were observed because that's snapshot mode and that's what happens. And uh, only 14 of uh, such targets have um, clearly emission line in the UV. And you see some of the 2D spectra and 1D extracted spectra uh, there. Um, the images are from our WIF3 uh, survey of 2016. And uh, you I, I, I move them around, try to put in the same orientation, more or less. And you see that you see the footprint of uh, the morphology of each PN in each emission line in carbon. So this is cool. This is what we have already seen a few years ago in the Magellanic Clouds, but that then this had uh, um, died and then res was resurrected. And this is what we can still do with this. It's great. Um, the analysis was kind of awkward because this is a non-supported mode for this. So um, luckily we had Rafia Gusha, which is the data analyst and stayed with me for a year. And uh, we did um, our own Python calibration and analysis routines. And thanks to the PineAb uh, folks, because there were really a lot of help for uh, getting the ionic abundances. I was new to Python and so it was kind of hard. Um, we did the atomic uh, abundances with the ICF scheme. We, for now, use schemes were in Barlow just to compare with other data in the literature. So of our 14 um, targets, we find two really main group for gas phase uh, carbon abundance. Uh, one is uh, with low carbon, just to be brief, C over O less than one. Uh, all the low carbon, all the five, three plus possibly two low carbon uh, oxygen, uh, low carbon uh, stars, planetary nebulae have uh, ORD dust type. So there is one to one correlation. And uh, they're all pretty far away and they have all, are all pretty high altitude on the galactic plane. And I use, I derive a distance scale from Gaia DR2 parallaxes, which is the best distance scale to date. Uh, I mean, uh, we 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 figured we cal we measured that. Um, so they apparently have uh, also low nitrogen. So they don't really look like uh, deriving from high mass progenitors. They are all bipolar. And then we have uh, um, another group which have enhanced carbon. Um, they are all CRD, as expected, but it wasn't shown before and uh, they have intermediate uh, nitrogen and they exhibit a variety of morphological types. So what we do with this PN, and this is my last long slide and then I'm almost to conclusions. So the PN abundances on the left plot have been compared with the tracks, of course, of cell revolution. Um, we assume that those are not common envelope, that didn't go through the common envelope. That's the only assumption we do. We don't talk about uh, binary or single stars, not just not common envelope. Uh, by comparing with the GB evolution, we figure out that uh, the low carbon stars, low carbon PN, uh, are the progeny, likely progeny of stars in the 1.1, 1.2 uh, solar mass regime. If they are about half metallicity, we figure out that there is a little bit of extra missing, mixing, giving the uh, higher than expected nitrogen abundances. Um, the enhanced carbon uh, planetary nebula are probably the progeny of the 1.53 solar masses of GB stars, and those are the two main groups. So we use the model from uh, Ventura et al, get a, a big, uh, an, a, an estimate of a, the, the mass of the progenitor, and then from, um, from the evolution of um, the, the fuel consumption theorem of Maraston and Renzini et al, we found the time, the age of the star. And from the age of the star, we assume, we uh, um, not assume, we um, infer a likely redshift. So here we have a bunch of these, tar of these targets that are, the one were formed, the galaxy was comparable to a Z equal to or Z equal one redshift. Galaxy. So we can put those um, probes into a gradient work, not yet because we have only five stars, but uh, as to constrain the gradient work. So we're really successful experiment. And here I show you that since this is a symmetric planetary meeting, 
even if they're very small, they are resolved with HST. And those are the shapes. The low carbon uh, uh, PN shapes are all asymmetric. So how come they are all asymmetric? They probably have a very low mass progenitor. We assume there is no trace of common envelope evolution. We assume that they have a, a subsolar, a substellar companion. And Two that's minutes. Why, yes, and that's why they got their shape. Those are the enhanced uh, carbon uh, PNs. Uh, we have everything. We have from the poster child planetary nebula, the last one, and uh, poster child uh, round and elliptical, and even a strange morphology for PNG 107. We have everything. And then we have two outliers. One is not very well determined, and the other one has very high carbon, but also high nitrogen. It may be a progeny of a GB star around three solar masses and just experience a very mild hot bottom burning process on the AGB. And I am at the summary. So we have 14 new UV carbon abundances and uh, of compact planetary nebula for which we have morphology because we have observed them in imaging with HST, but we also have um, the dust type except for one or two. And this triples the sample of HST carbon abundance of planetary nebula and, and tenfold, uh, no, 15 times fold the sample of a gas phase carbon abundance in galactic planetary nebula whose dust is also known. We identify a group of PN, maybe five, that have a very likely low mass progenitor. Everything showed that they have li um, low mass progenitor. Their dust, their gas, everything, their nitrogen, their oxygen, everything. So those are probably compatible. Those are probes that are compatible with the five giga year old population and then can be used to, to uh, constrain the cosmological models of um, evolution of star forming galaxies at Z larger than 0.5. So we can do really cosmology with planetary neighborhood. And then there are other groups that are not useful for cosmology because they are near Z equals zero for uh, given their progenitors. Uh, I, I would like to finish uh, underlining that we did recover a hundred percent correlation between dust phase and gas phase in the galaxy, in planetary nebula in the galaxy. And also, if I'm allowed one sentence for the future, um, I am a choir of a large program of uh, JWST, which will uh, uh, recover the gradients of high redshift galaxies. Those will be used in, um, um, will be derived in a strong line abundance mode, but still we can use this planetary nebula and H2 regions in the galaxy to constrain them. And also the dream is the ELTs, if we ever have a mass in the ELTs, we will have the same type of work up to Virgo. So instead of having one or two galaxies in which we can do this type of work, we will have a large number. So that's, that's the dream. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Leticia. Uh, do we have questions? So, quick questions. So, sure, go ahead. Yeah, Leticia, <clears throat> these are really interesting results. Um, and I, I love the, the connection to uh, cosmo cosmological uh, nucleosynthesis um, evolution. Uh, one thing that puzzles me a bit, actually, is why um, these subsolar metallicity AGB stars had such a hard time flipping their C to O ratios. If, um, it, you would think that, that, that it would be pretty easy for them to become carbon rich if they started out with way subsolar oxygen metallicity. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, my stellar evolution colleagues in the group say that uh, uh, to, to, to get the carbon is not easy at low metallicity, but to get rid of the carbon is very hard. Um, and you need to go above a certain mass. Uh, to produce carbon, you need to be above 1.1, 1.2 solar masses, but it's easier at low metallicity. So there is also the interplay with metallicity. For this particular interpretation and usage of PNs, we don't worry so much about the initial metallicity, but we look at it. We look at, for example, neon and argon and other alpha elements to make sure that we are not studying a population that is completely odd. But in general, when you go solar or galactic metallicities, you don't have big surprises because it's only at the SMC metallicities that things get really different. Okay, thanks. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, in, if you have questions for Leticia, so you can uh, put them in the Slack. And Joel, while you're here, 